I've entitled my message this morning, A Ministry of Repentance, and this will primarily come from the book of Matthew chapter 3. This morning we come to message 3 in our series on the life and ministry of John the Baptist, a very important, significant person in the scripture. He was a person who, as we have studied over the past few weeks, paves the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so being a figure such as that, there's a turning point that happens in the nation of Israel, a turning point that happens among the worshipers of God and in the world in the ministry of this man, John the Baptist. This morning, what we want to focus on in this series, in this message today, are some of the more common attributes of his public preaching ministry. And I think as we get into the main thing that we consider today, as we introduced for you just a couple of weeks ago, John the Baptist, the things we talk about today are probably going to be the things that you expected to hear about in the very first message in this series. Just to spend a moment of time in review to remind you the things that we've talked about thus far, message one in our series dealt with prophetic statements regarding John's life and ministry. And so from Isaiah chapter 40, we learned that this John the Baptist would be one who was a voice crying in the wilderness. And that speaks, as we emphasized, I believe, first of all, to the location of his ministry. He was in the wilderness of Judea outside Jordan, preaching the gospel and baptizing people. At the same time, you and I, as we cry out, God's will in the world, many times we feel like a voice crying in the wilderness. Do you feel like a voice crying in the wilderness as you stand for biblical truth in today's time? I think that you probably do. You feel yourself to be an outsider. You feel unwelcome, perhaps, ostracized from time to time. We very much feel as voices crying in the wilderness in this world. And that was one of the prophetic statements about John that we read from Isaiah 40. From the book of Malachi chapter 3, we read prophecy of John the Baptist as Elijah who should come. And not that he's literally Elijah who returned, nor is he Elijah reincarnated, but he comes in the spirit and power of Elijah with a very similar ministry to that of Elijah. There were times that Elijah was a voice crying in the wilderness as well. And then we ended that first message with a consideration of the angel's words the angelic proclamation to the father of John the Baptist, Zechariah, that he and his aged wife were going to have a child even though they had never been able to have children. God was going to bless them with an offspring, and this child was going to be the one who paves the way for the coming of Christ in the world. That led us to message two, in which we considered the fact that to John the Baptist, as we emphasized last week, to live was Christ. We emphasize, as we'll see today, his baptizing ministry. We emphasize the fact that he preached repentance. We emphasize his eccentric look, wearing camel's hair and a leather girdle, or his unusual diet of locusts and wild honey. But the most significant thing about John the Baptist that sometimes we overlook is for John the Baptist to live was Christ. And so... The most important thing to this man in his life is Christ. He lives in the world to pave the way for Christ. And he knew that. As they come to him and they ask him, as we saw last week, are you that prophet from Deuteronomy 18? Are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Who are you? Over and over, he simply tells them, I'm paving the way for Christ. And as we concluded last week's message at the end of John the Baptist's life, at the end of his ministry, as Jesus' movement grows and grows, disciples of John come and they ask, is it okay that more men go after Christ than follow after you? And as any gospel preacher would say, John the Baptist says, he must increase, but I must decrease. He was happy that people began to follow after Christ. In fact, as we noted just in passing, those original disciples of Jesus Christ, they begin to follow Jesus after his baptism. Where are they when Jesus finds them? They're at Jordan. 
These are men who are from Galilee. They work at the Sea of Galilee, most of them as fishermen, and yet he finds them as disciples, followers of John the Baptist. And so John begins to point his disciples to Jesus, and he does this even when he's in jail. He sends disciples to Jesus. Art thou he, or should we look for another? John is constantly pointing his disciples to Jesus, and as we'll see in the last message in this series, as he finally goes to his ultimate demise for standing for biblical truth, John is all the way up until that point pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in the prophetic message, message one, we talked about how he's going to turn people to the Lord. And so people are wandering about in this life, and you can see John, maybe in a metaphor, maybe in a word picture, just imagine this in your mind. John runs up to them, takes them by the shoulders, points them into the direction of Christ, and shoves them along. He's turning people to the Lord. He changes the direction of men and women, their lives, and he steers them towards the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the very most important part of the life of John the Baptist. Today we want to focus on the public ministry of John the Baptist. And as we consider his ministry, we're going to consider this in a couple of different messages. First of all, we're going to look at, as we titled today's message, John's Ministry of Repentance. Because as John goes and preaches, that's what John is preaching. Repent. Turn. Turn from the sinful things that you do in this world and follow God. So as he turns people to the Lord, what is he turning them from? Well, he's turning them from the way that they live, sinful, wicked, depraved lifestyles, things that even after the new birth we struggle with. Amen? Everybody here glorified? Anybody here glorified? No, nobody here is glorified. Nobody raise their hand. Any glorified people here? Nobody's glorified. And so since we're not glorified yet, we still struggle with sin. John takes people and he turns them from their lifestyles to serve the Lord. It's a ministry of repentance. In our next message next week, we're going to consider some of the other teachings that are commonly overlooked in the life of John the Baptist. What he taught the publicans. What he taught the soldiers. What he taught normal people, everybody else in their own individual lives. This was a man that had a very busy, active ministry. All this man did was minister. And I believe that's the basic pattern. We know that Paul made tents, and preachers sometimes do other things as side gigs, you might say, to borrow terminology from some things that I do on the side. But the important part, what was important, what mattered in his life, what his life's work was, was the ministry. And so he spends his time preaching and baptizing, and preaching, and baptizing, and that is all the man does until he's incarcerated, and even in jail, he's sending people to the Lord Jesus Christ. We often give you the takeaways for each message at the very end, and that's the word that I try to use when I give you a few points in closing to send you away with on your mind. But today we're going to do this a little differently. What we want to do is consider the takeaways as we get to each point. Because the points are so strongly there that I want to bring out that they make themselves. And to save them for the end would be to leave you hanging on several things that I think would be just better said as we go through this third chapter of Matthew together, considering this ministry of repentance that John the Baptist had. There are basically three points that I want to give you today, and we'll give them to you up front. Number one, John the Baptizer. Now, as we think about John the Baptist, you cannot say the man's name without thinking of what? Baptism. It's literally in the guy's name. Now, is Baptist his last name? No, Baptist is his title. Baptist is what he did. He is John the Baptizer, John the Baptist. And so we'll consider... For a great portion of our time together today, this ministry of John as he goes and he baptizes people. Now, this leads into something that is inseparably connected with John's baptizing ministry, that of repentance. And so, as you gathered from the title of today's message, a ministry of repentance, the second subheading, if you will, that we want to consider 
is the fact that John goes and what he's preaching so many times is repentance. And we'll see why this is so significant in his life. Now, every gospel preacher preaches repentance, and every gospel preacher needs to preach repentance. Every one of us, myself included, needs to hear repentance. But this is such a significant day as people are literally about to go from the old covenant worship to the new covenant worship, repentance is the key word in the ministry of men like John and the 12 apostles, even the Lord Jesus Christ, as he begins his personal ministry, would say the same exact statement as John the Baptist, to repent because something significant is happening in the world at that moment that we're still participating in today, 2,000 years later. And then lastly today, we want to consider what I would call the harsh statements of John's ministry. John was not, as we'll see momentarily, one of these modern type preachers who are not allowed to be controversial. He's not one of these modern preachers that only preaches sugar-coated, happy-go-lucky, three-point, live-your-best-life-now type messages. But John at times was so harsh, as we will see today, that he literally drove people away who came out to where he was preaching and baptizing. He literally ran people away. Now, if I did that, some of you might get mad at me, and if I did that being mean, you ought to get mad at me, but there are times when certain people need to be driven away from the flock of God because they're wolves in sheep's clothing. The last person you want in a congregation is a wolf dressed up like a sheep because putting wool on a wolf doesn't take away his teeth. It doesn't take away his appetite. What does the wolf in sheep's clothing do? Even though he's wearing the uh, the clothing of a sheep, he still bites and devours the flock. And so John, being this rugged, fierce, prophetic, Old Testament-type man, Sometimes when people come to him, knowing what they are through the Holy Spirit, he judges them harshly and he sends them away. John the baptizer. Baptism is without a doubt the most commonly remembered part of John's ministry today for good reason because he's literally referred to as John the Baptist. And so when I introduced this series to you, when we began talking about this, obviously you know it's some part of this series we're going to consider his baptismal ministries, baptizing ministry. Not only is this what he's known by us for in today's time, this is what John was known for by his peers. As John goes and he baptizes, people come from all Judea to hear him preach and many of them to be baptized by this man. And so not only, as we'll see, was he known for baptism, not only did people go out to be baptized by him, but others would even try to carry on this baptismal work in the name of John the Baptist after his demise. You can't separate John the Baptist from baptism. It's literally, as we said, in the guy's name as he's referred to today. Hence the term John the Baptist, John Baptist, sometimes as it's referred to, or we could even say John the Baptizer. Now, just to remind you, this is not his last name, just like Christ is not Jesus' last name. We have last names today, and it's a way for us to distinguish between people and families, and I'm very thankful for that most of the time. You know, when you're a Winslet, sometimes that comes with um, strings attached. We all have our families, we all have our names and our last names, the grandfather groups that we belong to. But men like John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, these are not last names, they're titles. John is a baptizer, baptizer John. Jesus is Christ, Christ being an adjective, Christ Jesus, anointed Jesus. And so these are titles that communicate something about these people to us. You could say Curtis the Dentist, right? That's not his last name, but we know that that's a title. Um, Hannah the College Professor, 
There's a few other things that I could have said, and I chose college professors, so be very grateful. We all have something that we do. Been the preacher, been the trumpet player. You know, so and so the student. I could have picked a half dozen of you here today. We know that that would be a title. So John's title is baptizer, and he's known by this title. Now, this is not so unlike the very name on the sign of our church today. I want you to think about this. John the baptizer is called John the baptizer or John the Baptist by everyone. I don't think when John began his ministry, he said, Okay, guys, I'm beginning my ministry I want you to call me John the Baptizer. Who began to call John the Baptist? And and I mean that, who began to call John the Baptist? Who called him the Baptist? Everybody else. This is not so unlike why we are known as Baptists today. Why are we known as Baptists today? Because we practice believers' baptism by immersion, at the hands of a God-ordained administrator who has been under the imposition of the hands of a presbytery, to quote most articles of faith, that date back as old as this country and before. We're called Baptists because we baptize. We are called Baptists because we baptize. Did we give ourselves that title in church history? We did not. In fact, prior to being referred to as Baptists, people who re-baptized were called Anabaptists. You know what Anna means? Well, it means that they're re-baptizers and they're against the baptism of the merger of church and state, which, as we'll see in a moment, applied to, in that day, infants, contrary to what Scripture presents. Scripture, as we'll see today, teaches believers' baptism. In immersion, by immersion. Not through pouring, not through sprinkling, but by immersion. That's why we do that, because the Word of God presents it as the way people are to be baptized. And so we're known as Baptists, not because we chose that title for ourselves, but because other people in church history called us that, and we accepted it as a label. Now, I know that there was a faction of people known as Anabaptists in church history in Europe, and some of those people we don't want to have a whole lot to do with because some of them were crazy and it was cultic at times and they led violent insurrection. No, we don't want to have a whole lot to do with some of those Anabaptists. But the term Anabaptist applied to anyone who refused the state-endorsed baptism of infants by the church merged with the state throughout church history. And I have quotes that far predate what we would know now as an Anabaptist. By the way, Anabaptist grew into the Mennonite movement and the Amish movement. But when we talk about Anabaptist as it relates to church history, that was a negative, it was a pejorative that was used to describe anyone who rebaptized believers that had been baptized as an infant. As far as John's baptism, and we want to talk a little bit about baptism today. This isn't the main point. We're going to try to hit it and move as quickly as we can. As far as John baptizing, we know that John baptized believers only. How do we know that? Because those that were baptized were baptized after confessing their sins. Now, we read an interesting psalm, Psalm 8, that talks about how out of the the mouth of babes and sucklings, God has perfected praise. God, as we saw with John the Baptist, can quicken people even in their mother's womb, but baptism isn't administered until a person confesses their sins and Christ, their faith in Christ as their Savior. And so when people come to John, when are they baptized? They're baptized when they confess. That's not saying, sometimes you get the kickback, well, are you saying that no infant can be born of the Spirit? No, that's not what we're saying at all. We're saying we don't know if they are until they profess their faith in Christ in a way that we can audibly understand. If a little baby's babbling, he might be praising God. I love to hear baby noise in church because I'm just thinking maybe that little baby's praising God. We don't know their language. 
Sometimes you can tell they're not praising God. They might be mad at their parent. <laughs> but sometimes when a baby's babbling in church, I just have to wonder, is this Psalm 8? Is this a baby crying out praises to God? But we don't know until they can articulate that. And when they articulate that, I don't care if they're five years old. You've got, you got two movements, one that goes to one extreme, one that goes to the other. When they begin to profess their faith in Christ, I don't care if they're five years old, if they profess their faith in Christ and confess Him and confess their hope in Him, we go to the baptismal pool and we baptize them. That's our practice. We know that John baptizes only believers because, number one, they confess their sins, and number two, because people without fruit meet for repentance. Guess what John does to them? He sends them away. And it's interesting that the people that he sends away are not people that maybe spent the Friday night before in a bar, not the harlots. The people that John sends away are the religious elite that were cruel and mean to other people. Now that's interesting, if not terrifying, maybe enlightening as we consider the mean spirit of some celebrity preachers in today's time. And at the same time, some of the opportunistic fake preachers that live on billions of dollars a year promising people that give them money that they will be rich too. Listen, there are wolves, wolves, and they can be conservative and they can be heretical in their theology. But when these people, the Pharisees, these are doctrinally sound people for the most part. When they come to John, you know what he does? Oh, he sends them away. Until I see repentance in your life, I'm not baptizing you. Go. And he sends them back where they had been. Number two, as far as John's baptism, we know that John baptized by immersion. John baptized where? In the Jordan. He's baptizing in the river. There's much water here, and this is where John baptizes. Every baptism in the New Testament was undeniably by immersion. Think about Philip and the eunuch. See, here is much water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And he says, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you may be baptized. And he says, I believe. And they go into the water. They go into the water, and he baptizes them, and then they come up out of the water. We know that baptism is by immersion. John baptizes here where there's an abundant water supply. It doesn't say John has a canteen. It says they go into the water. It wouldn't take but Jacob's well to baptize people if sprinkling was the way John did this. All you need to do is pull up some water and pour it on his head. But he doesn't do that. They go into the water. We know that John baptizes by immersion. And first of all, the word baptize, you know what it means? Hold on to your seats. It means, drum roll please, to immerse. That's a pretty good indicator to start with, that baptism is by immersion. To further prove that they're in the water in Matthew 3.16, as Jesus is baptized, we emphasized this last week, the Trinity making an appearance at the baptism of Christ as Jesus went straightway up out of the water, the heavens were opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him and a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. They come up where? Out of the water. Meaning they had been in the water. New Testament baptism is undeniably by immersion. Now, there's a couple of why nots that I want to emphasize with this, and then we're going to move on because today's message is not about baptism, but John the Baptist's ministry. But you can't talk about John the Baptist's ministry without talking about John baptizing. Why do we not practice infant baptism? It's a good question, right? There are millions of Christians throughout church history and alive in the world today who practice infant baptism. This is said for the sake of history, not for the sake of criticism or being mean. But I want you to know. In the early centuries, decades if not centuries after the time of Christ, some Christians conflated baptism with regeneration. They likened baptism and regeneration so strongly that they began to, began to view them as one and the same. 
and the infant mortality rate was sky high. So think about that. You're a, a parent. You know that infant mortality is really high because of disease and malnutrition. You believe that to go to heaven, you've got to be baptized. Was a thief on the cross baptized? No. Were, were all the people in the Old Testament baptized? No. You've got cases of people being regenerated before they were baptized, undeniably. John the Baptist being one. The Apostle Paul. There's salvation outside of the bounds of those who are baptized. As far as going to heaven. Now, baptism doth now save us. There's deliverance now and strength for the salvation God has given us now through baptism. But, as far as going to heaven, there are people in heaven who were never baptized. But people worried about that. They said, what's going to happen to my little babies? And so they began to baptize infants. Right? Now, where did I get that? Not from a Baptist. So, you know, one of the things that I like to do is listen to podcasts, and I found seminaries that have all of their lectures for their online series. I actually heard that in a lecture by Donald Fortson. I listened to all of Church History 1 and Church History 2, the entire two classes, as I cut grass, driving, you know, my mower, cutting grass, listening to Church History podcasts. That actually came from Donald Fortson, who is a Presbyterian, who practices infant baptism, who's a professor at uh, Reformed Theological Seminary. So that's not the words of a Baptist saying that. That's just church history. That's where the practice came from. We understand it, but we respectfully disagree, right? We understand it, but we respectfully disagree. We know that Christ is strong enough. I don't have to worry about my baby. Christ is strong enough. And we believe we ought to do this in the way the Scriptures seem to depict to us. Number two, why not then... Pouring as opposed to immersion. This practice is a little older than infant baptism. It probably dates to areas that didn't have large quantities of water in around the second century. The first record of this in church history is from an ancient document known as the Didache. I believe that's spelled D-I-D-A-C-H-E if you want to go look it up later not written by an apostle, not inspired of God, but it does have several different practical suggestions. And one of the things that was said in it was, okay, if you live in a place where there's not enough water, pour. Does the Bible say that? No. But it's clear that in the second century that began to be practiced sometimes where water enough to immerse was not available. We disagree, but at the same time, that's not an issue. Is that an issue in Huntsville, Alabama? We don't have enough water? I can point you to the Flint River. We're named after this river. I drove past where they put kayaks in yesterday. If we had as many people in our parking lot, cars in our parking lot on Sunday morning, as they have people going down the Flint River on kayaks, I would do backflips down the aisle. I bet there were 200 cars out there. I mean, I'm just like, wow, people like to float down this river. We don't have the problem of not having enough water here in the... Northern Alabama, Madison County Territory. we got plenty of water. We have running water here. That might surprise people that listen to the live stream that don't live in Alabama. Do you people have running water? Do you all still use outhouses? There was an outhouse at Ebenezer until 2006. Can you believe that? What country are we living in? Well, when I was a kid, there was no running water at that church because they were stuck in the Stone Ages on purpose. They had the money to build bathrooms. They all rolled up in Lexuses. No, but... Church is good enough, right? No, that's the worst mentality to ever have at all, period, hands down. Our our churches ought to reflect our living conditions. And so if our living conditions are nice, how dare us have a church with an outhouse? Anyway, I'm not going to get on that soapbox. I could spend about two hours there. Pouring began to be practiced fairly early as an alternative to baptism when water was not available. I believe that to be a mistake, and it doesn't apply to us to begin with because we have plenty of water. We are Baptists. By immersion, we practice baptism. John baptized by immersion upon believers, and so we practice believers' baptism by immersion. Now, I want you to notice this from the book of Matthew 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, We'll emphasize verse 2 in a minute, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat, his food, was locust and wild honey. Now listen. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. This man's ministry was so well known that people throughout all Judea went to his baptism to be baptized of him. Now, that does not mean that everyone, all people in Judea, were baptized of John. We simply know that's not the case. There were lots of people that were not baptized of John. First of all, the people he sent away, that's a pretty good example of that. Secondly, there were people who had no interest in what John was saying. They didn't care to go to his baptism. All Judea there means that from every province of Judea, notice that it's contrasted with Jerusalem, Jerusalem and all Judea. And so not only from Jerusalem, but people throughout all Judea. That's what the all there has reference to. Remember, all doesn't hardly ever mean everything or everyone without exception, but without distinction. And so all Judea here doesn't mean every person in Judea. It means all the provinces of Judea. All throughout Judea, people come to John the Baptist to be baptized of him, and they are baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. All sorts came to be baptized of John from all provinces of Judea. Now, they're baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Transitioning into point two. John preached repentance. What does he say in verse 2? Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John preaches repentance. What sort of repentance is John preaching? Well, first of all, John teaches people to turn from their sins. How do we know that? Verse 6 As they are baptized of him in Jordan, they confess their sins. And so when people come to John and they say, I want to be baptized, what they commonly do is they say, I have done this, I have done that, I have struggled with this, I have struggled with that, and so I request baptism. And as they come confessing their sins, what does John do? He baptizes them. They confess their sins. John baptizes them. This is a baptism of repentance, as we'll see in just a moment. They confess their sins and they are baptized. As a takeaway, so many times in our modern, proud, masked, and I don't mean COVID mask from 2020, I mean I put on a mask and look different in public than I am in reality. So many times when people join the Lord's church today, now, we want to hear how you love the church, but one of the things that we also want to hear is how you feel yourself to be a sinner, and yet Jesus is an even greater Savior, and you believe on Him. A lot of times when people join the church, I just love this church, this place just feels like home. I'm not criticizing that. We want to hear that. We hope it feels like home. We hope you love this place. Amen? If you joined the church and said, you know what, I love the Lord, I really hate this place, but I think it's the thing I need to do. <laughs> okay, maybe that's not the best thing to say. I hope you love this place. I hope you love everyone in this place. But there's a part of joining the church in which we need to have emphasized our sinfulness. Both in terms of me feeling my sinfulness and us hearing that you also feel your sinfulness, if everyone in church always has their own sinfulness in view and Christ's forgiveness and grace in view, what you'll find is you have churches full of people that can live at peace with one another because you're not proud. You're humble. You know that you're a great sinner. And so when they join in with this movement, again, a movement 
preparing the way for Christ. It is assumed that John's disciples should go on to follow Jesus. What people do is they confess their sins. One thing that I want you to do, those of you that have not joined, that one day will, because praise God, God moves on his people today. I want you to think about your own sinfulness and tell us that. And then tell us how you, you so have so much thanksgiving in your heart because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope that you have in him. I always love it the most when I see people come forward to join the church with tears in their eyes and they say, I'd love to have a home here. I don't feel worthy, but if you'll have me, that tells me that somebody's heart's in the right place. Amen? Amen. I hope you feel that way because I certainly do. I don't for a moment feel as if I'm worthy to be here in person, let alone as a member, let alone as the man that gets to share the Word of God with you. I don't feel worthy to do this. And you know what? I'm not. But I am through Christ. And you are through Christ. And so we confess that and we profess our faith in Christ. And that's what the church is. That's what the church is all about. Keeping that in mind helps us be at peace with one another, too. Here's a point that I want to share with you that I heard recently on the radios. I'm driving home from a rehearsal. John has a ministry of repentance, but John also has a ministry of reconciliation. Do you remember that from the book of Malachi? Just turning back a few pages to the last statement in the book of Malachi, the last statement in the Old Testament. He, John, shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. What is that when you turn the hearts of people back to one another? We call that reconciliation. Repentance leads to reconciliation. If you are at odds with somebody and they are at odds with you because of an offense... Or maybe because of two offenses. Repentance, turning from the offense, leads to reconciliation. I heard this point made, and it was profound, and I never thought about it, and I want to share it with you today. As I said in a radio ministry I was listening to, there's a difference in forgiveness and reconciliation. I ought to know that. I think we've all known that. But there's a difference in forgiveness and reconciliation. I can forgive someone for something that they have done, but still not be reconciled to them because the problem is still there. I don't harbor a grudge. I'm not mad at them. I don't wish them ill will. But until there's repentance, there can't be reconciliation. Until there's reconciliation, we can't walk together. Can two walk together except they be agreed, as the, promise, uh, the prophet Amos asked? No, they can't walk together except they be agreed. There's a difference in forgiveness and reconciliation. Sometimes we might have forgiven somebody, but there's not reconciliation because they're still doing to us and others what they did that caused the problem to begin with. We forgive as Christ forgave us. But reconciliation is an additional step. We all knew that, even though we didn't know that, right? I think we all knew that. John preaches repentance, brings reconciliation between people, and this is a part of his ministry as he preaches to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice this in verse three or verse 1 of chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now emphasizing that phrase, kingdom of heaven is at hand, just briefly, this is a long awaited for, biblically, prophetically foretold moment that those who lived in Israel were awaiting as John the Baptist began his ministry. When he begins his ministry and he teaches, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he is literally telling them that which has been foretold by the prophets is here. Where is that foretold? Let me give you the most explicit reference to it. Daniel 2 and verse 44. You don't even have to turn there if you don't want to. It might take you a while to find Daniel. In the days of these kings, the Roman Caesars, Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed? And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces. 
means it won't be conquered like Jerusalem. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Literally prophesying of New Testament Christianity. That there is a kingdom we are translated into by the new birth that we enter into as we enter its gates in this world through repenting and believing. I hope you've had a kingdom experience today. As we sang holy, 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 I had a kingdom experience. Did you? I felt to be in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. In the days of the Roman Caesars, God set up a kingdom. And what does John begin his ministry preaching? Repent, the kingdom is at hand. Long awaited for, confirmed to already be here in Hebrews chapter 12, we have come to a kingdom that cannot be moved. We are in the kingdom, the church, the assembly of the saints. So think about that from the message of repentance. What are they being told? Turn from your sin because God's kingdom is here. God's kingdom is here now in the world. Turn from the sinful lifestyles, the philosophies of this world, the way the world thinks, the way the world does things. Turn from that and come into the house of God and worship Him in spirit and in truth as a citizen of the kingdom translated into citizenship when God quickened you. And if you have any interest in what I'm saying today, that's because God has quickened you. And so come into this kingdom and enjoy life in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Experience assurance of your salvation, a peace of God that passeth all understanding. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. Combining these two thoughts, John the Baptist, the baptizer and repentance, in the book of Acts chapter 18, as, John, as Paul rather finds people who had not yet received the gift of the Holy Ghost, not the new birth, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He asks them if they've received the Holy Ghost, and they say, we've not so much as even heard whether they be a Holy Ghost. He says, what then, unto what then were you baptized? This is Acts 19, rather. And they said unto John's baptism, notice what Paul says, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is the only case of rebaptism in Scripture. And that's not just me saying that. Every single English translation that uses parentheses ends the statement at verse 4, making verse 5 the response of the people. Some people like to group verse 5 with verse 4 saying they there, the antecedent, is the people that John preached to. But no, the they there is referring to the group of people that Paul is speaking to. John baptized with the baptism of repentance. These people had been baptized by one of John's disciples who tried to carry on his work, and it was not the proper baptism. They're commended for being baptized and following Jesus in some sense as disciples of John, knowing only repentance, but Paul rebaptizes them. Paul rebaptizes them. Remember, baptism is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. What do they say? We've not heard if there be a Holy Ghost. They didn't have New Testament baptism. John's baptism was authentic, but these people had been baptized by someone who carried on John's ministry. Lastly, we come today, just in brief, to some of the harsh statements of John the Baptist in his ministry. So what if a person wanted baptism because it was popular Maybe because it helped their career, but there's no repentance. There's no change of life. There's no desire for Christ. What happens? John sends them away. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7. Many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism. He said unto them, O generation of vipers. Harsh statement, right? He sees these group of people adorned and decked out, probably broad phylacteries. A, a frontlet is a big block of wood they'd wear on their head to show everybody how religious they were. You know, they literally walked around with a block on their head. You blockhead, you know, hello. A block on their head with a Bible verse written on it. 
And they'd make them bigger and bigger and bigger. I guess some of these guys walk around looking like Minecraft characters, just a big square block. I'm trying to wake you up because I know we're about done. They come rolling in there with their impressive garb and their sanctimonious facial expressions, and John tells them, you snakes. Whoa. You know, we, we like to joke around. That's a way to win friends and influence people. You know, preaching is not winning friends and influencing people. It's preaching the word. John rakes these guys over the coals. Now, to be fair, John knows things about them that we might not perceive. I can't tell when someone walks in this building if they're a part of the generation of vipers. Can you? No. And so what we do is what they did in the book of Acts. You've got people like Simon Magus, a reprobate man that comes in because he likes to deceive people. And he is baptized, then tries to buy the power of the Holy Spirit with money. And Peter tells him, your money perish with you. That man went on to found Gnosticism. Historically, Simon Magus. What do they do with that guy? They bring him in. They baptize him. He shows his true colors. They send him back away. That's why there's a, a, such a thing as church discipline. Even then, we admonish them as brothers, hoping they repent and come back because we don't know. John the Baptist is a special man. Remember, part of his ministry is prophetic. Old Testament, prophet. Just like he is New Testament preacher. And the Holy Spirit would communicate with him in ways that it does not communicate. He does not communicate with us. And so they show up and John says, Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham our father. I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, there's some points that I want to give you to take away from that. God doesn't need fake worshipers. And when I say that, I don't point at you. I point at me. Ouch! Have you ever pretended worship? Be honest. Have you ever gone through the motions of being in God's house? Now, let me tell you, if Sunday morning rolls around, you don't feel like it. You get yourself here anyway because he deserves it. God doesn't need fake worshipers. What is this an era of time of? People worshiping him in spirit and in truth. That means it's got to be real. We really mean it. He doesn't need fake worshipers. Who has warned you, you generation of vipers? Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. What would it take for John to baptize these people? For them to show a change of life. Bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. What is the last thing that he tells him? God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Because these Pharisees think, hey, we're Abraham's seed. John says, God can take rocks and make children of Abraham who will worship and praise him. What is Abraham? The father of the faithful. We've emphasized that over the past few weeks. Months on Wednesday nights. Abraham is the epitome of living by faith, and so those who belong to Christ, they're prophetically referred to as the seed of Abraham. God can raise up seed to Abraham from rocks. You know what's so interesting about that? You guys are the rocks. Are you the biological seed of Abraham? No. But God has raised up even of Gentiles, seed of Abraham, fulfilling the biblical prophecies regarding blessings in Christ from you people who are, and me, who are Gentiles, outsiders, people who had a hard and stony heart that was removed as it was given, as they were given a heart of flesh. And at the same time, you and I are lively what in the temple of God? Stones. God is able of these stones, rocks as it were, to raise up seed of Abraham and true faith worshipers, people who worship by faith. What's the message about today? Repentance and baptism and assurance and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. May we repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know when Jesus began his ministry in Matthew 4.17, that's 
what words he used. You know when he sent the disciples out two by two in Matthew chapter 10, what Jesus told them to say? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know what I tell you today? May we repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. His majesty, his glory, his power, his dominion, his sovereignty, his authority, it is at hand in this room here today. May we repent and follow him as his kingdom is here with us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that the kingdom is at hand. Thank you, Lord, for the grace of repentance. We know, Father, that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. We know, Father, that our lives are changed as we are drawn from death and sin to life in Christ. We know that everything that we have is through grace. We don't repent in and of ourselves. You have to take away our hard and stony heart. And praise God, you're able of stones to raise up seed of Abraham. And we know, Father, that we are living fulfillments of those words of John the Baptist as people who are outsiders to the commonwealth of Israel, yet are worshipers of God in the kingdom of heaven because your son will draw all men, that is all sorts of men, to him to live in him and to worship him. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins. We know, Lord, we are all sinners. We confess our sins and we just pray, Father, that we'd spend the rest of our days confessing our sins but rejoicing in the goodness of your son that died for our sins to take them away, that even though we're still yet sinners in the world, we've been made righteous through him in your sight. Father, we pray for repentance. We pray for many to come out and to be baptized in thy name. We pray for forgiveness, and we give you all the glory and the praise. We say together, amen. Praise God from whom.